Hey, product launchers, welcome back to Product Launch Hazards, and I have got a great introduction for you. I'm gonna introduce you to one of my favorite referral partners, Genemex. Genemex is the coolest company because they are like a single source, that, a single source that can help you all the way from prototyping, engineering and design, all the way through to getting your product onto a shelf, like just getting it all the way through that process and making sure you can deliver. And I've got, David Shatayat with me. Um, he is one of the, uh, you're a founder, right? And uh, one of the two brother partners? Well, uh, Tracy, thanks for having me. Uh, I'm really uh, happy to be here talking with you. Um, I'm actually, I'm not a founder. Uh, the, the company is a family owned business and was founded by my father. Um, Your father, was, oh. Yes, 45 years ago. Today, you know, I, the company is run by three brothers, and I've been working in Genemex and been a group CEO for, for about 15 years now. Wow, wonderful. Yeah, and I mean, we've had, we've had, I did an interview with you for uh, one of my articles. You guys write some great blogs, which I refer to all the time, and that's kind of how we kind of got introduced to each other. Um, not quite a year ago, but a little less. And um, I've been super excited about working with you because and sending clients your way because you guys are a one-stop shop. Like in that, and there's so much of the development process that needs to get managed. Can you tell me a little bit about the scope of services of what you guys provide? Sure, yeah, I'd be happy to. Um, predominantly, we're a contract manufacturer. That's the focus of what we do for our clients. Uh, manufacture products, predominantly also in China. Uh, we have offices in Taiwan and in Shanghai. But we do have a turnkey service uh, in that we support our clients in their product development, engineering, and design of uh, bringing those products from concept to actually manufacturing. Our focus is mostly, when it comes to development, is on the more of the back-end side of design and, and engineering. So we call it DFM work, design for manufacture, where we take typically concepts that have, a, have, the, have an opportunity in the market, and we help take those, those aesthetic designs typically and, and execute them through engineering and get them ready for manufacturing. Right. And that's why we're great partners because we do more on that aesthetic and, and product planning side of things and research about what you should make and then figure out what it should look like. And from there, you guys figure out how to make it, how to make it really cost effective, who should be making it for you, what, what processes you should use and, and then dialing that in so it's as good as it can be. And I think that's such a critical part of the process. Exactly. That's, that's, that's our focus. You know, we, we, there's so many places where companies and brands can spend their time um, in growing, like developing new products for their business. Uh, we add to those resources. We support those resources when it comes to development where we can, kind of tie in the whole manufacturing side of the development process so that you're not designing in a pro in a vacuum yeah. uh, that you're designing with some knowledge coming from the manufacturing side or do these concepts make sense? Will they be able to be executed? What are the costs and the basically cost benefits for some of those decisions? So there, you know, you're taking into that into account and that helps reduce risk and increases the speed at which you can then enter the market with that new product. Right. And really, it's about speed nowadays in retail. I mean, that is what we're seeing, whether it's on the shelf or online, doesn't really matter. It's like if you're behind the curve, getting the market because you didn't get the price right, you didn't get it made right, and you got to redo, that's puts you at a disadvantage. Exactly. And our, our clients also have a lot of things going on. They're spending time developing their, their business, selling their product, um, communicating with consumers. They may have very aggressive product development schedules with lots of different products that they plan to bring to market. It's hard to do everything in-house. You can also outsource to other, other, other partners. And, but, you know, and that's where, how we, we um, uh, mesh basically or, uh, or integrate ourselves with our clients because typically we have a very long-term relationship with them. We understand their business and then we have, we cater our services to, to understand around their needs and their category of products. 
Yeah. And I think that the category experience, this is something that I was just on the phone with a, cl- with a potential client earlier, strategy call. And we were really talking about that, that sort of having category experience is tremendously valuable nowadays because it, whether or not you're sharing that exact data, it's informing your decisions. Oh, if we don't get that price lower, it's not going to work. If it doesn't have this baseline feature functioning extremely well, it's not going to sell as well. And we provide those information, those of us who have category experience, and that's hugely valuable. That, that totally makes sense. And because you want to know what's selling well, what's doing well in different markets. And that's an area that we can actually help on too. We don't really go into the market and understand what consumers are thinking, but we can do back end sort of su- support where we like, we can go into the factories and say like, you know, which, which SKUs are doing well, what materials are new, what are some new innovative ideas around a product category that then can inform a marketing team or, you know, create a team like yourselves, like in making, you know, you know, pushing the limits, adding on incremental, incremental sort of innovations on those ideas ideas. Yeah. So I, you're big on telling stories because you got a lot of history of stuff that doesn't work and stuff that does. So I'm going to tell a quick little story, but I'm sure you're going to have one to match it. That's probably greater. But I, we had, I interviewed a company. I, I've told this story, I think on the podcast before, but I interviewed a company who's making socks and they were brand new to the category. They thought that it was great. They went to this sock manufacturer that they were very confident about in Asia. Um, I'm pretty sure they were in China. And um, they were really confident about it. And their goal was to make the softest pair of socks. And they were men's and they were like cool and patterny and bright colors. So they wanted really bright colors and really soft. And this is the only criteria they gave the factory. And, they, and then they designed them together and, and all of that um, and gave this criteria and kept you know, refusing samples till they got the ones that were softest. They bring it out to market. I'm interviewing them. They send me some samples for review. My husband wears them for like two days, two days, washes them a couple of times over the course of a week and they fall apart. And I took one look at it, which I hadn't really looked at because the sock was in a pack. And I just handed it to him, say, hey, try these out. Tell me what you think. And so when I, when I pulled the sock out and looked at it, I went, oh, you know, I, I have category expertise in knitting and, in, and I looked at that and went, well, I see why there's a hole. It's because your yarn length is too long in the areas at which there's the greatest wear, plus you have kind of a little seam which creates an abrasion point. And I just looked at that and went, oh, well, why didn't your factory tell you? And mm-hmm. unless you have that collaborative relationship like you have with your factories that we have with ours when we work with them, that you don't get to that point at which you have the conversation where they're going to come back to you and say, wow, I don't think that's a really good idea, right? Because you're not having those conversations. They say the customer's right. And the customer said they want it this way. So we're going to make it that way. So you and I know that we have to open up that dialogue because our factories will tell us this isn't a good idea, but they won't tell everyone. That's true. I mean, it's interesting that, I mean, what you've said like about, focusing on just one feature and not thinking about the, the entirety of the product and its, its, its actual functional use. That sort of problem comes up all the time, especially with <laughs> clients that have less experience. I'm pretty sure that client won't do the same thing again. No. <laughs> uh, but it's, it, can be a, it can be an expensive uh, uh, um, or at least time consuming error and can be expensive if let's say if it wasn't such an obvious problem um, and was something that was related to more high levels, heavy use, usage and stuff like that, that, you know, if you were to go into production and only find out from consumers, you know, three months down the road or whatever the timeline is that there was a disaster. I mean, your whole business could well, be. Well, especially set. an electronics or something like that, or, you know, some battery issues as we've heard big companies make mistakes with batteries all the time. So, yeah, I mean, it can be really costly, really time consuming. And, you know, in this particular case, um, it was about a $20,000 issue for them because they were like, we can't sell what we have or we're going to end up with bad reviews. So they had to pull all their inventory and it was almost like relaunching again by the time they got it. So they were lucky that they hadn't really gone full launch, but wow, you know, what a delay and what a capital cost, right? Yeah. It's, you know, that I didn't know that they actually went into production. I'm sorry that, that, they, that, they, had yeah. to, that they had to learn at that point. Um, you know, and ideally that this stresses the need for, you know, 
not rushing to market without testing your product before you launch. I mean, it's one of the critical steps in, in uh, bringing a new product to, to market. And one of the things that, I mean, you know, people like yourself and, 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 and Genomex, you know, one of the things that we do that we help, I think, guide our clients into um, the, into good product or project management sort of um, practices uh, and processes. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. And those things, I mean, those things sometimes are so simple. However, they have immense, huge consequences that if you don't do them, like if you don't test your product adequately before you go into production, um, you have a problem like yeah, you know, and you were talking about brand growth before, and that got me really thinking about how important the systems and processes and documentation is, right? Because you've been doing this so long, you have sample review documentation, I'm sure, sample request documentation, I'm sure you've got a whole set of forms. So you're in a way setting in good practices. So eventually, if your team, you know, your team is uh, building a team in-house for a client as well in the future you've set up these good practices along the way of what the paperwork should look like what the system should look like so some of the development they can take on on their own we do that as well so yeah and we do have those that good practice in-house uh, when it comes to stuff like sample reviews but you know it, it extends to the general product project um, execution how to launch a project correctly and our clients really come from different levels of expertise I mean we work with fortune 500 companies down to startups that are just entering you know single person startups that are just kickstarters you guys have a lot of kickstarters <laughs> exactly exactly and, and so you know we 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 work with clients with different levels of infrastructure and expertise you know and so sometimes we're working within our client system sometimes we're managing up and and helping our clients you know we manage the projects with them and we encourage, you know, we encourage the right, you know, certain types of project management techniques. You know, we, we tell them when to come to China and, and, re and review things. And, you know, we, we work with them on the process and setting up standards and things like that. And so, so we, and then as what we see is that with those clients that are, 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 are you know, they're typically you know, entrepreneurial, great learners, and they develop quickly and their business matures and their needs change over time. And we move into, into less of like a managing up sort of situation and more into like, a, you know, expanding the line rapidly or, or growing the business, helping them grow their business. Right. Yeah. And that's just where, you know, we're all here. We're here about the right things in the right order with the right resources. And it's that it's that order of process that it, it's different in every trajectory of growth plan. So at the startup stage, it has a different order than it does when you are at that advanced Fortune 500 brand stage. Right. So, you know, having the capability of scaling um, from the way that you work is great. But at the same time, what you guys have that I really appreciate are these fabulous practices for quality control for what design for manufacturing like you're doing all of these things so that they don't have to be redone later that's why that right order matters and, and that yeah and our attitude towards quality is um you know i think it's a simple idea but it, it, it makes it makes a lot of sense in our experience is that you know quality is not one step it's you know it starts from the beginning of when you're designing the product um and when you're selecting that manufacturer that's the probably the most important part of the of ensuring that you actually have quality goes at the end you know you have to think about setting up very clear established uh, standards um, you know you, you know, good communication of those standards throughout the supply chain so that it's very clear requirements that everyone's working towards on the same page and then you eliminate 95% of the issues there's still gonna be 5% of problems that you couldn't anticipate um, or more hopefully not but <laughs> You know, but then it happens. You're, <laughs> then you're finding out the you're finding those things that are harder to find, but still very important, and, and you're solving for them, and you're not dealing with like a nightmare sort of disaster scenario. 
<laughs> that's right. So, so we, yeah, I agree with you. Like quality and price are designed in, like that's kind of our, our a motto in it, that if we don't do a good job from the beginning, understanding how it's going to be made, understanding how it needs to be priced, then it's really hard to be great at quality and great at price. And so the only thing you can do is to redo later. And that is a costly and expensive and time consuming proposition. And you repay and you repay for it. It's really what in the end it costs you more. Exactly. I mean, yeah. My, I spend a lot of my time, you know, thinking about how do we reduce the risk of projects? You know, what kind of tests, what kind of prototypes can we make? What kind of, you know, what questions should we be asking? Which sort of technical issues should we be digging into in order to basically check boxes that reduce risk for a product, you know, and, and, and so we spent a lot, our team, we spent a lot of time thinking about that. You know, we try to encourage our clients to think in that way as well. Um, and and what, what, it, what, what ends up happening is that we, we, we end up being able, to, it might sometimes take longer to start the project, but then we actually, we actually deliver earlier. Right. It accelerates later, right? In better planning, <laughs> faster delivery. That's how I always look at it too. Yeah. You know, one of the things that I um, enjoyed so much about our conversation we had, we, we, we did an article on, on sort of like Chinese New Year and like the timing issues of things. It's like having a sense of like what's going to impact your timing is a direct impact to budget as well. And, you know, having that, it's like, this is not the best time of year for you to be doing this product. <laughs> you know, have, and just knowing that from the get-go, you're always proactively thinking for your clients for the projects for the, and advising them and saying, you got to get your orders in now. Cause if you don't get them in, you're not going to get them and you're going to be out until spring and things like that. So how do you, how do you keep on top of that? I mean, you guys are uh, not a giant organization, but you're big um, compared to my small team. So, <laughs> so tell a little bit about how that works for you. Well, I think the first thing we focus on is trying to understand what our clients requirements are, what their needs are. So, you know, we have to work back from that. Um, so, you know, we, we ask, you know, we try to ask those questions up front, you know, when do you need a launch? What's your goal? You know, you know, is that set in stone? Why, why do you have that goal? We understand it, it's always, it, for us, it's always about trying to understand why, why do you want to do that? But sometimes people have arbitrary goals, so then it's maybe not so important. Maybe they have, you know, they're planning a huge event. They must have the product ready for that event, a trade show or some other kind of event. And therefore, you know, that is fixed in stone. There's no way to work around it. So, right. you know, we have to understand, we understand the requirements and that's the most important thing. And then we try, then we assess, okay, what do you want to do? And that's again, more requirements, but that has to, that's not schedule. It's just product. What are the things that you want to do? We, if, those, if that's not clear, we try to help them guide them through establishing that and putting that down in writing. Sometimes we get instructions orally and things like that. And it's like, Oh, everything's clear. Right. And I'm like, yeah, it's clear, but is it really going to be clear three months from now? Yeah. When we go back and we say, I thought you said this, but I'm not really sure. So, you know, we put it all in writing and we have a big team. We got to make sure that everyone in the team kind of has access to this information in a very concrete and, and you know, we don't want messages to be passed between people and, and then also then to suppliers or quality control personnel and things like that where, you know, maybe it gets lost in translation and literally is translated too. So yeah, yeah, you know. that's so true. <laughs> so we, you know, we, we focus on, on understanding exactly what they want to achieve. And then we say, and then we go and manage expectations and say like, look, based on our experience, these things that you want to achieve are possible or not, you know, in the time that you have allocated. And, and you know, this one, yeah, maybe it's possible, but there's a risk that this might delay the project. So, you know, maybe we should reconsider some of these requirements or your schedule, one of those two things. But you have to understand where the risks are and what we think we're 100% confident we can do, what we may have a chance to do, and what we for sure can't do. And so we try to set those expectations clear, you know, in the beginning. It's very hard for us because we don't always know what's yeah. going to happen. So we try to- Because it's not to, fully you know, defined yet, right? <laughs> it's not fully defined yet. And, 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 our, and I think- in, I'm sure it's your experience too. There's always unexpected sort of issues that are going to come up, unintended consequences for decisions that we can't anticipate what's going to, so we have to build in buffers and we have to be conservative. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. And, and it is in that um, not rushing process though, and having those buffers in there that give you that comfort level that we can accomplish this and accomplish it right. Cause rushing is always 
I mean, there's always, you add too much risk in the process. One other thing we do, you know, for example, for, for projects that are extremely time sensitive or have high risk of failure, I like to take the approach of parallel path sort of uh, problem solving, you know, which doesn't require more resources and tech, you know, and, and is it, it, it takes up more time, you know, because, you, you know, so we have backup suppliers. Typically we may be parallel path two set different techniques for manufacturer parallel path prototyping with multiple suppliers. You know, when we do that, it, it, it's more expensive, but my experience is, you know, we obviously always judge like the cost to do it versus the risk and try and, you know, see what I would, I like to err on the side of caution um, because, you know, things, if something's going to go, if, well, I don't know, there's a saying, you know, if something could go wrong, it will, or however yeah. you say that. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Um, that is, that's my, that's our, our everyday experience. And so we have to have backup plans and we have to be adaptable and be able to, to pivot quickly when something's not going right. And that's something the hardest thing for, for us and for our clients to do is that we run into a challenge. We run into a problem. Do we keep trying to just power through it and solve it? Or do we say, look, this is not a good path. We need to change the path. And that's such a hard decision to make sometimes. And sometimes it seems like it's more costly time-wise or resource-wise to change direction. But uh, sometimes that is the best, like cut your losses, yeah. change direction and solve and like, and just, and just solve it for good, you know? And that's, that's a hard decision to make. And one that you kind of sort of, you gain it with experience. Yeah. Absolutely. I, I totally agree with that. The, the amount of experience you guys have is amazing. Now you said you're one of three brothers who run it. What is the, what are the, what are your brothers, other brothers do? <laughs> and so I can kind of get a scope for us. Is one of them over in China all the time? Yes. Uh, Jonathan uh, Chitayat, he's in Shanghai and he's our China CEO. He runs basically operations for China and Taiwan. And so he, he's, he's, he's managing the team uh, from a day to day and like uh, interacting with clients, uh, factories, and, and the, just the whole basically the operational side of the business, you know, and, and he's, he's, he's the brother that's on the ground. And in addition to him, of course, in China, we have a, a strong team of senior staff there, but he's, you know, he's, he's in charge with the operation there. Um, our other brother, Tal, Tal Chitai, he's in New York, actually. He doesn't actually have a direct operational role in, in, in Genomex at this time. He used to many, many years ago. He, he started, he, he's been, he started an internal startup with some consumer brands um, and he's managing that that business today. He's got a little side project. Love it. <laughs> so you're, you know what, that, I think though that's really valuable because now you've got information on, you know, what it's like to be a startup today. It's very, very different, right? And you know, what, what those issues are and what, what they're surrounding. So, so I, what makes a really good client for you, David? I mean, you know, what, how, how do you, do you just take phone calls with anyone? Like, how do you evaluate them? Cause there's going to be some people out there going, am I right for Genomax? I like, I like David. Everything sounds really good. Yes, yes, yes. But am I right? And so how can they, how can they evaluate themselves or how can you evaluate them? Well, you know, that's a tough question to answer because I think that yeah. there, there is, there is a broad range of clients that we do work with and we're very happy working with. Um, you know, we look at the long-term sort of viability and the relationship with the client, the potential there. That's, that's the most important thing. We don't look at individual, we don't really work one off with clients very much. And that's, or if we do, that's really not our model and not what we're interested. We're in, we're in like a high volume, low margin business. So we need volume. Yeah. We need repeat business for our, our, our model to work. So um, you're looking for brand builders, brand growth, that kind of thing. Yeah. And, and ideally we're looking for clients where we add a lot of value. I mean, I'm, I'm you know, we're, if we don't add value to a a client supply chain, then it doesn't really make sense long term. So, you know, we look for clients that value um, the services, that, like value development support. They value high quality of service. They value um, maybe they have complexity in their products, so therefore they need more management. Um, they have complex supply chains, or they buy different types of products, and they need a, like one point of contact to consolidate a supply chain. 
you know, those kind of, they have maybe requirements of speed to market, things that basically say like, hey, you know, there's, 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 there's a lot of work to be done here. Um, and, you know, you guys are actually going to add a lot of value to our supply chain. And that's where we're going to, we're going to have a long-term relationship. And that's where I, I think that there's a lot of potential. Where we don't add a lot of value is, is, is in like, let's say someone says, look, I have this bucket. It's a plastic injecting bucket. I just need 10 in a box. I just need it to be as cheap as possible. There's no complexity. Like it's just a total commodity. There's nothing to it. There's no, you know, and then, you know, we're, we're, you know, we can do it. We can be very competitive, but honestly, you know, it's just, it's just a price game and yeah. there's not a lot of risk and not a lot of service involved. And, you know, we don't really add that much value. And so I'll say, you know, that's, We'll do it, but you know, well, we don't have a lot of those on this product launch platform because I mean, these are people who there are you, your listeners out there and viewers, you are inventors and you are entrepreneurs building brands. Um, you are Amazon sellers who said, Enough with this, you know, wholesaling stuff, let's uh, let's start making our own brand, let's start making our own products. And so, you've already got that sort of sales growth underneath you, you're great at the marketing, you just need somebody to really help you you know, amp up that product development and get great products in. So, you know, that's the kind of people we have up right here on our platform and we're really proud of all of that. So I think they're, they're really right for you, most of them. So that's really good. So now you do sort of an intake evaluation and, and that's all available. And Anna Pappas is on our platform and she, um, you can contact her directly. Um, all the links will be in the post um, for this episode and you'll be able to just go straight through or send her an email see what they think. She'll be happy to help you and, and look at that as it, see if it's a fit. So David, before we go, cause this is what we end every one of our, our intro episodes to, you've got to have a great story of the hazards, the single Z hazards <laughs> of product mm -hmm. launching. You've got to have a great story there of some of the things that have gone wrong, the really good, the gone wrong things. We'd love to hear one. <laughs> uh, okay. You're like, which one? <laughs> So the thing well, I have a lot. I have a lot. I have a lot. Um, I'll, I'll, I'll tell you. I'll, I'll tell you one that. I mean, there's a, there, we have a lot and a lot of stories, and I can tell you ones that, that ended well, and I can tell you ones that <laughs> didn't end well. Um, Let, let's do an end well one. We could use a happy end ending. Well one? <laughs> yeah, let's right, do a happy ending. An end one. Well. All right. All right. <laughs> most, most, most of the stories end well, but you know, the ones that didn't end well, those are the ones I've learned the most from. I think. Probably. Um, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, I'll leave that. That's too. I'll get too depressed. <laughs> <laughs> um, so yeah, we had an experience. This is this is to do with um, factories uh, situation. It was a, it was actually a vacuum cleaner that we we were doing for the automotive industry for a brand that that sells into um, major retailers like Walmart and things like that. So and it was an auto vac for cleaning cars, um, and we had a we had a good supplier that was actually making the product. We've been doing it for a while with them. But um, we got news that they were under the group, they were part of a group in China and they came under uh, some kind of financial trouble. Uh, they had too much debt with some of their other companies. I don't really know the nature of all the, you know, the exact details. Stuff of like that happens all the time, product launchers. <laughs> they, I've heard, I've had it happen in, in chair industry and other industries. So it happens all the time. Yeah, so, you know, and we got that news from, you know, our guys on the ground that were in the factory that were doing some inspections on some products that were shipping out. And we kind of got some wind through the grapevine that something was going on. We then, our, our, our account manager and myself, you know, we basically dug into it and we were like, all right, these guys are in trouble. Like, there's, there's some serious issues here. They're, we're talking to the, the, there are... They were not owner managed. This is a pretty big company. It was professionally managed, and so the they, you get a lot more uh, honest information from professional managers because they're probably going to get they're losing their job at the same time. Um, and um, we were we went inside uh, into the factory and we were working with them to basically pull the tooling out uh, for this project so that we they wouldn't go bankrupt and then go into receivership um yep. bankruptcy court you know be you know and therefore we would have everything locked down by the uh, local government um we had to negotiate with them then also with their sub suppliers uh because not all the tooling was done was was in their actual factory some of the components were outsourced to other suppliers 
we had to go through and, and negotiate with every, everyone, find an alternative supply chain, another factory that we could then move everything to, um, and, and then quickly move into, into production there. It was, it was pretty tough because, you know, we, we, were, we had to get, we were dealing with people that had to agree um, to do things that, you know, that, that maybe weren't in their, the company's necessarily best interest because if they were to move all the tooling out, they lose all their business and then they are in more desperate financial condition situation. So, but we were able to manage it. We had to like, you know, um, pay some unpaid bills or not unpaid bills, but new bills that came up that didn't exist prior to this discussion. Um, yeah. and, <laughs> I, and I know exactly what you're talking about. <laughs> um, but the, the people there were overall good and they were actually honest, I think. And, um, and we, and, and we moved the tooling out and we moved production to a new facility, uh, quickly ramped things up, went through some of the approval and testing that we had to do, air freighted a couple containers for our client. We paid for that. And, and, and the promotion that we were working on for them, that was the Costco promotion. It was a test order that actually, because oh, we did that miss, time, Product launches, you cannot miss your timing. You miss your timing and you will not get back in. So, yeah. <laughs> So the, the, the great thing was that the test actually went well. You know, it could have been like we did all this stuff, spent all this money, and like it didn't go well. It went well. They followed up with, uh, you know, 150,000 units that we produced for Costco. And, it, you know, we ended up getting a chance to make back some of that money that we lost in that whole process. But, you know, and, 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 and the client we still work with in the day. We've been working for like 20 years. And, and so that one ended well. But yeah, yeah, but that you touched on things that happen all the time, right? You know, ownership of tooling, it, it needs to be clear. And then even still, it'll be a negotiation when the time comes. How to quickly p pick up and seize a tool if you need to. Like, I mean, there's so many little things that having someone who's been there and done that again and again and again is so valuable. And that's why you are one of our right resources here on Product Launch Hazards. And we're really happy to be in partnership with you on that. So thank you so much for joining us, David. We really appreciate it. And we're so glad to be partners with Genomex. Tracy, thank you so much for having me. And thank you for all of your support. So product launchers, you can find all about Genomex. You can meet David and Anna right on our platform. Don't forget to go to the blog post um, and you can link through straight to that. Thanks again, product launchers. Talk to you soon.